Welcome to the Exploring Washington State podcast. Here's your host, Scott Cowan. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Exploring Washington State podcast. This is episode 221. Today, my guest is Gary Campbell. Gary is the owner of Crane City Music, and Crane City Music specializes in providing Seattle hip-hop artists with premium vinyl records. Kind of a very niche thing that Gary's doing. It's really quite interesting. This is a really long episode, and so we've broken it up into two parts. So this is part one. Gary's uh, originally from Canada, uh, moved to Seattle for a job with Amazon, has uh, extensive background in online technology um, in the video space. And uh, when he moved to the United States from Canada, he found hip hop because he had moved to New York City, found hip hop and found it to be a really American um, musical form and something that he uh, immersed himself in, in because he wasn't seeing that up in Canada. So as he moved to Seattle, he immersed himself in the Seattle hip hop scene. And we're going to talk about all of that. So welcome to part one. Um, but before we get started, if you would, how about sharing this episode with somebody who might like to hear about Seattle hip hop or about Washington state? Love it. If you'd share that out with some friends. And if you would also leave us a review on whatever podcast uh, platform you listen to our show on, that would be great. If you have any feedback you want to give me directly, my email address podcast at explore and I'll respond. So Buckle up, sit down, enjoy, grab that beverage, and let's get started. All right, well, welcome back to this episode of the Exploring Washington State podcast. My guest today is Gary Campbell. Gary, I found Gary through the Cell Times. They did an article on Gary and his record label, the Crane, Crane City Music. Gary, I'm going to just ask you a quick question. Crane City, was that a homage to all the cranes on the towers in Seattle? Yeah, and and it, it was. Um, I will say, in 2017, around the time that I was starting this project, um, it, Crane City Music started as a single album that was going to be a compilation of um, hip hop artists from the Northwest, and mm-hmm. uh, one of the working titles was "Sounds from Crane City" uh, because Crane City was a term people started using around that time just to refer to Seattle because there were so many cranes all yeah. dotting our skyline. They were like redwoods everywhere. There was an artist that is on the compilation uh, named Do Normal, and she is a Seattle rapper. Um, and she had said to me at one point at a show that you know these cranes were just you know, like spr- sprouting up like trees everywhere. And they were going to be part of our landscape for decades to come. And and right around that time, there was a, a cover story on the Seattle Times that said, you know, welcome to Crane City or something like that. And and I just started seeing this term show up a lot in, in conversation as kind of a shorthand for Seattle. And as I said, the compilation was originally called uh, Sounds from Crane City. And then as we evolved, uh, that became the name of the label instead of the name of the album. Okay. Well, besides, now we know the name. Now we know. Now I sure. know how. So, give us a little background about you. Where, uh, what I know, this is what I know about you. Uh, you're originally from Toronto. I right? am. Okay. Um, I hope you're not a Blue Jays fan. That would make this awkward conversation awkward. But you know, it's okay. No. Um, and you you moved to Seattle. How many years ago did you move to Seattle? Now ten. So ten years. So yeah, okay. I I um. I'm from a small town called Brantford, which is actually the home of Wayne Gretzky. So Wayne Gretzky okay. was a was a, a big figure when I was young. Um, he he was kind of the pride and joy of the our hometown, okay. and and he of course at the time was winning Stanley Cups, and he was suddenly the the greatest hockey player who'd ever lived. Um, well, and, was. You know, he he grew up you know <laughs> a few blocks away from. Uh, my, my parents' house where I where I grew up, and actually my siblings. I have two brothers and a sister who are quite a bit older than me. And my brothers played um, like backyard baseball and things with Wayne Gretzky when he was young. Um, okay, all right. And uh, so so certainly the the Wayne Gretzky shadow loomed large over Brantford growing up. Uh, <laughs> and, and and actually, it's funny. I was just back um, in Canada a couple of weeks ago. And um, there's a Brantford Hall of Fame 
um, which is a sporting hall of fame for kind of great Canadian athletes and people in uh, sports. And not only is the lion's share of the museum dedicated to Wayne Gretzky, but my dad was a big figure in Canadian soccer in terms of starting uh, soccer leagues and so on in um, Ontario and in my hometown. And okay. uh, consequently, there's actually a small exhibit about my dad and his legacy. Um, he passed away 20 years ago, but he um, he made a big mark in my hometown as well. And so there's a there's an exhibit about all of his work uh, in my hometown as well. Okay, wow, that's yeah. that's that's very cool. So I'm on I'm on your website. Oh yeah, I'm gonna I'm just gonna read it because this is half the fun of it. it. Says hi, I'm Gary Campbell, a Canadian designer and visual artist based in Seattle. That's true. I, sp- I spent the, l- the past 26 years helping media brands, tech firms, and the music industry solve complex strategy, branding, and systems design challenges. I go on to say I've made magazines, films, drawings, digital prototypes, education, curriculum, painting, ceramics, and more. What does that mean? <laughs> what is, what is the, what mean? Like the, what, what have what, I done? So- yeah, what have you what have you done? I mean, what's I mean, it goes on. You've you've got your sure. your you're named inventor on multiple patents. Um, yeah. What brought you? Well, this is interesting. When you were eighteen, yeah. you won a. Is it Glenhurst? Is that the name? Yeah, is the that Glenhurst the... Art Prize. Okay, and yeah, you... it's a, so when I was um yeah when I was a kid, I was really ambitious. Like I think the Wayne Gretzky effect was was looming large over a lot of us and. Um, you know, as a kid, I was really wanted to excel at things. And, um, I was actually, when I was like, a 12 or 13 years old, um, I was flagged uh, as were a number of kids in my hometown to go into kind of an experimental education program. So from, you know, 13 till 17, 18 years old, um, I, I didn't go to regular high school. I okay. I was in this program where we as students sort of just taught each other how to do school. So there was no there was no real curriculum. The teachers were just there as kind of to help do the the guideposts. But if we were learning about uh, you know the Civil War in the U.S., it, it was really up to you as a student to find something about that that was interesting to you, and then learn about it, and then teach it to the other students in the class. And oh, so wow. it was kind of a, a strange, just one of those things when I look back on my high school years, I, I realized, especially when I talked to other people, how uh, unusual my high school was, because yeah. as I said, like we, we didn't, me and the sort of 30 odd students that were in this program, like we didn't have a structured um, education. So we were, we were just kind of, kind of let to our own devices to dig in on things, be curious discover what you wanted to discover, you know, write essays and, and things about that. We didn't have any regular tests in this age of, you know, standardized testing in the U S it's, I, I had the opposite education, which was just sort of let these kids run around and hope they figure things out. Um, but what's, what's remarkable about this program is that, uh, I went through this program and I, I, a number of my classmates, obviously in high school that, I became quite close with them because it was really just a small group of us. And we, unlike most people whose high school experience is going to a huge school and interacting with a thousand students. um, For me, high school was, was 30 of us in a room every day for four years, um, just kind of making stuff up. And, uh, but what (laughs) I want to say is that, is that many of the people out of this program have gone on to be extremely successful. Um, I had this close friend, uh, Neil Legali, who uh, years ago moved to Sweden, of all places. Um, but he now makes uh, artificial eyes, and he gives people sight who are blind. And he went to school for engineering, and he went to school for, for medicine, and he learned how to make bioengineered eyes. And, wow. and he just it was just a big article about him because he's created, he's given eyesight back to 30 or 40 people who had been kind of previously declared completely blind. Um, that's, that's amazing. And I gotta, and yeah. I gotta, I gotta but, ask you this question. This sure. is the question that pops up to my brain and I warned you about, you know, we're going to go off the rails. Of course, that's fine. So you've got 30 classmates, let's say, give or take, and you're kind of, you're, des- you're, the structure is 
if you were interested in something, you go learn about it and then you come back and you bring it back to the classroom, which is correct. I think a very cool thing. Did you, did you go on to university after high school? I did. So how was the admissions process though? I mean, you didn't go to this traditional school. So how did the university take that body of work? And Oh, you know, it's interesting. So what happened in this program is that we were all thrown back into sort of regular high school in our final year. And okay. um, I mean, I actually found school that last year of school was really a challenge um, because in many ways we hadn't been well socialized the way a lot of people are <laughs> because mm -hmm. we've been around the same people that we'd been around since we were 12. It's, it was like Harry Potter, you know, we were all around the same kids for years and years. Um, and, uh, but the thing was, is that we were all kind of terrors in our final year of high school because we, <laughs> you know, for me, I was like, what do you mean I got to do this test? What do you mean I got to go to class and like read this book? And, and follow these rules. And, and I felt really bullied and pushed around in that final year of, of high school because I, I had had so little in the way of restrictions. But at the same time, the flip side was also true in that, um, you know, I was just like, I'm going to conquer high school. I was, I ran for school president and I won. And so mm -hmm. I was the high school president in my final year of school. Um, I was one of the leads in the school play. Um, I ran the, the the school arts journal there was like a poetry arts journal and i was the editor-in-chief of that um i ran the local the, the the high school art club i played soccer and i was really you know i was i was one of the star you know midfielders on the team okay. um, and and this sense of like having to kind of do it yourself and and dig in and um yeah ha having to to not being given any rules uh, and and being given a, a blank canvas a lot um, is is something that once you get used to thinking that way, you often, and I think about this today, like I, I approach problem solving in exactly the same way today that I did when I was 17. Um, it's just now it's like, oh, okay. You know, it's, it's obviously dovetailed well into our conversation about me being in the Seattle Times. Um, you know, in 2017, I had this opportunity to start, uh, or I had this idea to start a record label uh, to help out, you know, young Seattle hip hop artists. And so right. I just did it. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't ask permission. I didn't say, oh, how, how would I go about doing this? Who should I talk to? I just sort of decided to, to start it. And, and I did it. Um, and, and yeah, I think about that in the context of sort of how how I, when I went to school, that was sort of how school started. But okay. you, you know, you had a different question about education and, and well, university just, and so on. So we can talk about yeah, that as well. It's just, it's fascinating. So let's, but you brought, you, you brought up hip hop and not asking permission, just going for it. Mm -hmm. When did you get exposed to hip hop music? And I mean, were you exposed to it in, in your youth, your adolescence, when when did hip hop become a genre of music for you that you found to be enjoyable? It's funny, you know. I someone recently joked to me that I'm actually so I, I was born in 1973, and uh, you know, there's the the origins of where hip hop came from. There's a whole bunch of mythologies and stories about those early mm -hmm. days. Um, but the one of the widely widely agreed upon moments was uh in 1979 um the uh, sugar hill gang released rapper's delight and right. that song was this massive international success it was mm -hmm. 12 minutes long and it had guys talking over over beats on the radio and it was so novel and different and yeah. um that was 1979 uh, i was still a little young and for me when i was a teenager um, groups like Public Enemy and the Beastie Boys were sort of big in the charts, and and mm -hmm. suddenly that was an introduction to hip hop music for me. Um, you know, hip hop when I was that age was was cool. Like there were cool kids who listened to that, and I wasn't cool, and I didn't listen to music like that at all. And in fact, I wasn't honestly when I was seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty years old. I wasn't that interested in hip hop music. Um, okay. I was really interested in indie rock and 
grunge and and sort of British shoegaze music and the, the things that were sort of uh, popular in my social sphere. Um, okay. But it's funny, you know, I, so I um, started looking at the opportunities to move from Canada to the United States in 2012. So just to, just to quickly bridge high school to 2012, which is a period of 20 years or so. Um, I, um, I went to high school, I went to university, uh, in university, I took fine art. Um, and uh, I did drawing and painting, that sort of sort of thing. Um, I also took Japanese classes in university and uh, studied a lot of um, Japanese history and, and things like Zen Buddhism and mm-hmm. um, Taoism and, 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 and Asian religions. Um, and then I got out of school. I was a bit lost for a while. I didn't really know what to do with myself. And um, I had an opportunity to work for a magazine. Um, there was a government program that, that um, existed in Canada where a magazine could hire uh, someone out of university and the government would pay some of their initial, it was almost like an internship, but the government right. would pay you a small amount of money to, to, and the employer got paid in order to employ a young person who's fresh out of school. And so I benefited from a, a government program to uh, give me a job essentially at this magazine. Okay. It was someone who was starting a new um publication and they had a skeleton crew and so everybody kind of did everything and um i was doing everything from you know reading an article and then calling sources to make sure the quotes were correct to Mm -hmm. um doing some article writing to um because i had this background in fine art i would um we would sometimes have to lay out our own stories for the magazine page so we would have this you know, this page layout software and um, you would write this story and then you'd have to do an initial layout. And, and as I said, because I had an art background, I would always be like having suggestions of like, Oh, what if we put it over here? We could put a picture here. And what if we pulled the pull pull quote, we could be over here. And, and I sort of found myself um, more and more making side deals with some of my coworkers where, you know, they would do the writing of the stories and I would lay out everybody's story. And, and at okay. some point I, I became a magazine designer and, um, but it, <laughs> it wasn't something I went to school for. And it was something that I, um, I was good at and I had an aptitude for, and, um, you know, because I had gone to school for fine art, I understood color and layout and composition and, and some of the basic sort of ideas that, that go into a magazine page layout as much as anything. Um, So I did that for a while and uh, I made this transition in the magazine world from doing print magazine design where I was designing, you know, physical magazines that were sent to people's homes to the, this transition that happened, I guess this was sort of 2007, 2008 was this, this, this rise of magazine websites and blogs and and Instagram and social media and Twitter and and publications were suddenly realizing that they had to think uh, multi-platform and multi-dimensionally because you couldn't just make a print magazine and expect that that was going to carry your um, business and your brand into the 21st century. So um, I happened to work at a big company that had sort of 10 or 12 magazine titles under one roof. And that company was starting a sort of nascent uh, website team who was going to be responsible for designing um, websites for all of these magazines. And I made this <laughs> jump in my career to, to being sort of one of the digital designers to create these websites. Um, and that was a fascinating job because it, um, it, it was filled with these moments of saying, okay, you know, I, I worked for, say, a um a city magazine so one of the magazines that i I worked for that i I worked on the um on the publication was a magazine called toronto life which is much like uh seattle net or seattle magazine or the stranger it's sort of a Mm -hmm. an arts and culture magazine that covers um what's happening in toronto so this might be everything from restaurant reviews to highlights of arts and entertainment interviews with celebrities who live in toronto 
um, you know, a big feature profiles on the politics and sort of the, the scene of what's happening in just in Toronto, in, in the life of people who live in Toronto, real estate and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and one of my first jobs um, on the digital side was to take this magazine, which was a monthly 100 page magazine and think about how do we create an experience that can be daily and uh, sort of quick hit content out of this publication. And, um, you know, we started looking at some of our, our, our metrics and who was coming to the site and when were they coming. And the one thing that we really realized early on was that m most of the traffic we were getting on the website was to our restaurant reviews and people were coming our, to the site around three o'clock in the afternoon and they were spending about 10 minutes on the site. And, hmm. and so, you know, one of the, the big insights that, that I had that we implemented was let's, instead of trying to take this magazine and, and cut up all these pieces of this magazine and put them all onto the internet, which is what was done at the time, was let's double down on restaurants and food content. And, and let's focus on having a daily blog of restaurant food information. We'll update it every day at three o'clock and because we know people are coming to the site during this period of time and we'll have small hits like here's great places that that you should eat at dinner for dinner tonight here's mm -hmm. here's great places that you know here's a, here's a profile of a new chef that is making really interesting things that you should check out and this was a huge success uh, at the company and and then we had to sort of take the same model and apply it to other publications whether it was a wedding publication or a um a fashion magazine or um, you know, a, a publication that was a, in the sort of book industry doing kind of like a publisher's weekly and sort of, mm -hmm. again, trying to think about how do you take these magazine brands and rethink of them as digital properties and how someone might want to interact with them online. Let me ask you something Sure. Of, uh, in this, this stable of magazines that the company had, were you able to find something like the three o'clock people are coming to look for restaurant recommendations for every topic? By and large, I would say so. Okay. And and oftentimes okay. that was really a starting place for us because you didn't, you know, there's, on one hand, you're looking for these signals in your traffic that will tell you where, where's a good place you can invest time and energy to mm -hmm. emboldening and strengthening this, op, this audience. Um, but then you'd also have moments where you'd say, okay, we want to build up our real estate profile. And we don't have a lot of people coming to the site right now for real estate content. Mm -hmm. So we need to think about how do we build that vertical for this brand? Is that something where we need to um, align with, you know, a local real estate association and bring in, you know, real estate experts who can, who can talk about some of this material? Can we, you know, we did a lot of partnerships with, with other uh, businesses that were doing things online in the same way. Um, that we're having success and that maybe would allow us to um, kind of grow some synergies based on working with sort of, you know, smart partners. Um, okay. But yeah, we, we did this for, um, as I said, there were, there were 12 magazine titles um, that we worked on over that time. One of them was actually an online only property. So that was a, again, it didn't have a print publication to sort of base the, the thinking on. Um but, you know, I did that for a while. Um, I was good at it. I ran this this digital team. It was about 30 people that um, I oversaw. Um, and that was everything from designers to editors to writers to salespeople to uh, people who were doing the back-end coding to make the websites work. Um, okay. And really trying to rally this, this uh, whole company because not only was this a, a building of a new business for the company to having this – online material but we thought about ipad apps and mobile editions and what are we doing on our, on smartphones um but also it was a huge cultural change that was happening um at these publications because for so long the the print publication had been the 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 er part of the brand it was the part that that you based everything off of and and we were finding that that we were discovering there were huge pockets of audience that were only ever engaging with the website or the social media and had never really bought the magazine and weren't interested in buying the magazine. And so that was a whole other shift as well that was going on um, at the time with what I was doing. Um, but, you know, I, I, um, 
So I, you asked this question at the very beginning about hip hop and how did I get into hip hop? And, yeah. and I seem like I'm the furthest I could be from that. But, but what happened was that um, Toronto media is, um, I mean, Toronto's a big city. It's 6 million people um, live in Toronto. So it's. Is it that big? Yeah. It's, it's. Um, the, I had no idea. I didn't know that 6 million people lived in Canada. Oh, yeah. The population of Canada is 38 million. So. Oh. And okay. actually, in the in the hierarchy of cities, uh, the largest city in North America is Mexico City. Uh, yes. And then the second largest city is New York. Third mm-hmm. is L.A. Fourth is Toronto. Uh, fifth is Chicago, and sixth is Houston. So, so that's I sort would, of where Toronto fits in the, in the ranking. I would not. I would. I. I would have. Thought if you would have asked me, you know, pick a pick a U.S. city that's approximately the same size as Toronto. My honest answer would be Seattle. Mm, I would, yeah. I, I, for some reason, I've, I've, I've associated those two now, obviously incorrectly. So there we go. Once again, I'm admitting my lack of intelligence to the uh, to the world. Oh well. No, you know, um, it's it's funny because I I would say. Um, a lot of people I meet in Seattle, um, when I say I'm Canadian, immediately assume that I'm from Vancouver or that I'm yeah. somehow connected to the West Coast of Canada. Uh, mm-hmm. And and Vancouver is, I think, maybe 2 million people. Um, it's it's also quite a bit larger than Seattle, but it's, mm-hmm. um, but it's small by the comparison to um, Toronto, Toronto or Montreal. Toronto. Um, so oh really you know yeah okay well well let's 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 rub this back into washington state uh, sure they, not, nothing nothing against canada i don't mean like that no but, no I, I, US, yes, yes, um, I wanted to get to your question which was really how did i get involved in hip-hop and that's that's yeah. where i wanted to get to was that um the the toronto media scene uh looks a lot to new york city for um you know, ideas, direction, kind of vision. Okay. Like there's always kind of a uh, looking to New York for what, you know, what the gold standard is. And okay. at some point in my career, I reached a point in Toronto where moving to New York City was the next obvious step um, in terms of building my career and growing my career. And uh, so I went to New York um, in 2012 and uh, I was really struck by hip hop music when I was in New York. And to me, um, hip hop is something I very much associate with the United States. To me that okay. there's like a, a, a directness and an honesty and a uniqueness to hip hop that is, you know, it's like people say about, you know, jazz being an art form, a music form for that is unique to the United States. And for me, hip hop is similarly something that, that I, so deeply associate hip hop with the United States and living in the United States and trying to understand life in the United States. Um, I find hip hop can be a good way to do that. Um, okay. And so I became really interested in, in the, in the music and the art form as, as it connected to the country and as it connected to me living in the U S and trying to sort of navigate being a foreigner and being, being Canadian and having a very different upbringing and, and so on as compared to um, someone who might've grown up here in Olympia or Tacoma or Seattle. um, You know, I found hip hop was a way for me to, to understand um, the life and struggles of people here uh, in a different way. Okay. So you, that's okay. That's fascinating because yeah, that's, that's, I could, I'll just leave it. I guess what I'm trying to say is I, I've spent my entire life living in the state of Washington. Sure. So I, I'm, I'm acknowledging that I'm coming at this from a very small <laughs> lens uh, of, you know, I've not lived, I've not lived in New York. I haven't lived in Toronto. I have, yeah. I've lived in Seattle and I'm now living in Wenatchee and, yeah. That's very. They're both very different. Uh, I've lived all over. I lived. I lived in France for a while. Um, that was another oh, wow. another place I lived for a bit. I lived in Quebec for a while. Uh, I lived on the top end of Vancouver Island briefly. Um, yeah, I've I've uh, I, I've tried to move around. I've been a bit nomadic. Both my 
this sounds very sad, but both my parents passed away when I was in my early 20s. And so um, I have always felt a bit nomadic in my life mm -hmm. ever since then, because I, I haven't had the, the call of home in the same way mm -hmm. that someone who's whose parents who may still be alive would have um, towards towards feeling like you've got to go back to your hometown because I don't have anyone in my hometown um, okay. uh, living there anymore. So it's 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 been for me, it's always been about moving around to see new places has, has been a big part of my identity. Um, okay. I, I found my way to Seattle at the start of 2013. So at the end of 2012, I was in New York and um, I got a phone call out of the blue from Amazon. And, um, it, you know, it's, it's an experience that is, is very unique in that it's not unlike Pete Carroll calls you up one day and says, Hey, uh, you know, we just traded Russell Wilson and we need a quarterback. You want to come be quarterback for the Seahawks? Um, it's, it's an experience not unlike that where you, Amazon just calls you one day out of the blue and says, Hey, we saw you, you've been doing cool things in Canada and we saw you won a bunch of national awards and we, we want you to come work on this team of all stars that we're putting together to work on kind of this big media project. And what do you think? Um, so, so that brought me to Seattle. It was, it was, um, you know, Amazon, you know, tries to hire the, the best that they can find you know, all around the world. And, and you come here. And when I, when I first arrived at Amazon, um, you know, I didn't, I'd never really been to Seattle. I, I didn't know anything about this place. Um, and uh, I remember one of my coworkers was, was really excited as we were building this team that was going to work on a big video project. Um, we were building what was essentially Amazon YouTube, sort of a, a short video hub for all of mm -hmm. this video content that Amazon has. Um, and, and this is things like, uh, product reviews that exist on product pages or, um, you know, marketing videos that might be from Roomba or, uh, Samsung or some company, like there's all this, this huge volume of video that exists all throughout the Amazon ecosystem. Um, mm -hmm. it's primarily about products and, and what people love and don't love about products, unboxing videos and, and so on. Right. And, and there was this initiative that I was brought here to work on was to try to make sense of all of this video content. Um, Ooh. and my background in media and sort of working in these large projects and trying to make sense of how to, how to think about a brand, um, was what, uh, was, uh, the main appeal for Amazon to bring me in to work on this project. Okay. Um, and, uh, but one of my coworkers who, who as we were building this team was probably 50 people or so on this team um, hung flags in our workspace for all of the countries that everyone who's working on this team were from. And so we had, we had flags from Ukraine and we had flags from China and we had flags from India and Pakistan and, uh, um, Malaysia. And it, it was wild to, it really felt in that first team, it really felt like, like being in the Olympics. Like I, I was, mm. you know, yet another person who was from Canada who, you know, had arrived to work on this project and, um, we were, they were, the company was assembling, as I said, a little United Nations of, of ec people who had experience or expertise in this space and they thought could help with, you know, creating this project and making this successful. Okay. Um, so, so that was interesting because my first experience of Seattle was extremely, uh, international in many ways. Um, which is, I think, a big contrast for for the experience of people who who are from here, and I think probably like yourself would probably have a different take on Seattle as as not, not a little. Pardon? Yeah, I, I would. I agree. A, a little. Yeah, we probably think of it as more uh, uniform, homogenous, right. maybe. Yeah. So, well, let me ask you this question. So, you find hip hop to be a uh, a uniquely U S thing. Sure. So I think that's kind of changing your words a little bit. So the hip hop scene in New York, you come to Seattle. How does Seattle, how does Seattle's hip hop scene in your opinion, compare with what you were, what you were experiencing in New York? Well, you know, it's funny. So one of the things I wasn't in New York city for very long, um, but I was, I was in Bushwick uh, in this part 
of the city that was kind of the Williamsburg, Bushwick, Brooklyn thing that was happening, mm-hmm. was happening right when I was there. And there were all these really amazing um, concerts that would happen on like building rooftops where mm. you had to know someone and then they would tell you and there'd be a password or there would be some back staircase. You'd have to know where the staircase was to get up on the rooftop to go to the show. And, you know, it, it wasn't <laughs> that it was a, a secret thing and you had to pay a $50 cover or something. It was just th- these were parties that were happening that were a little bit off the grid. And, right. and the music scene was just really vibrant and alive. And when I came to Seattle, I was was interested in finding that here in the city. And, and I wasn't sure what was happening in Seattle. Um, you know, as I said, I worked in Toronto for a, a big city magazine where we would cover restaurants and um, we would cover arts and entertainment. And we would cover sort of what was happening culturally in the city, not unlike how The Stranger does or Seattle Met or the Seattle Times does here in Seattle. And so I found myself really digging in, looking for what were the things that were happening that that were you know culturally really exciting in seattle um at the time and Mm -hmm. and it's funny you know you have have somebody like um uh, macklemore and ryan lewis whose song thrift shop had just come out and they were suddenly yes pardon wow i just i just realized you moved to seattle that that year that's right (laughs) okay and and that song was blowing up like everybody was like that was you know and he was representative like it or not of what the seattle hip-hop scene was and um you know i saw macklemore and you know he's he's a very uh uh he works a lot on his craft and he takes it very seriously um and um you know i saw macklemore perform at you know like a a club like chop suey in front of like 50 people and Mm -hmm. and it was um it was that at that time when that song was just starting to to blow up and and things were happening and there was this brief light that was being shone on seattle and and the seattle hip-hop scene um although and this this happened with mix a lot with with his uh you know i like big butts song as much as it happened with macklemore with thrift shop is that the the lens the focus wasn't on the scene writ large but this one person and this right. argument that that person was was emblematic of everything that was happening here that that and i i found in many ways what i was interested in wasn't macklemore and wasn't the success that he was having but were all of these other musicians that were also making music in the northwest who weren't necessarily getting the the big uh, spotlight that Macklemore was getting. Um, and, and I found myself really interested in starting to go to, um, hip hop shows and just sort of see what was happening in and around, um, the Seattle scene. So this was, this is 2013. So there was, um, artists like, uh, Gifted Gab and Jar of D and, um, uh, Stas the Boss and, uh, Sassy Black. They, they were a group called The Satisfaction, um, who were on Sub Pop and they had just released an album called Earthy that was really exciting. Um, Shabazz Palaces is another group on Sub Pop who was releasing music around that time and represented a sort of alternative to Macklemore, um, of what mm-hmm. was happening in the, in the hip hop and the rap scene. And so I started going to a lot of these shows. Kung Fu Grip was a big band that was, um, uh, it was a it was a duo of um, these two rappers, Greg Cipher and Fish, who were making kind of this really high energy kind of jump off the stage, stage diving kind of hip hop music that was really exciting. They just had these this crazy high energy live show and would just be kind of the, the show would just sort of knock you off your feet when you went to see them. And and I so I started going to a lot of hip hop shows. Um, and and it's funny, I started around that time because I, I was a newcomer to the city and I didn't know anyone um, really outside of a handful of people I was working at Amazon with. Um, my wife and I moved here, um, as I said, and we were sort of newcomers to the city. And so I started going to hip hop shows and I, I started an Instagram account because around 20. 20- 12 was Instagram was fairly new as well. Um, and I started an Instagram account primarily for my friends and family back in Toronto to, to okay. kind of update on here's what I've got going on in Seattle. Like here's, 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 uh, my wife and I's life, um, what we're doing in Seattle. And as I went to hip hop shows, I would film these, these little clips from the shows and post them online. 
And this funny thing happened in that first year was that um, there, I guess, weren't a lot of other people online covering or talking about this music. And the artists who would, you know, I, when I would post a video of a show, someone would uh, see that video on Instagram and I would have tagged the artists that were playing at the show. And those artists would then repost my video to their own feeds. And, and suddenly I, I became this um, person that a lot of local rappers and people in hip hop started following because they okay. saw me as someone who was like a journalist covering the local hip hop scene or something. And so I, I became this person that was like, Oh, you gotta, you gotta follow Gary or you've got to invite Gary to your show. And so I started getting, you know, DMS from rappers. I didn't know saying, Hey, I'm playing a show in this back alley behind an auto garage. You've got to come to my show. And, uh, you know, so I started going to these these hip hop shows because I got invited to them, and and sometimes they were really fun, and sometimes it was, you know, I mean, I'm 49, I have a gray beard. Um, sometimes, like, I would show up and I would be at least 20 years older than anyone at the show, and and so I really stood out, and so people right. not only uh, was I being invited to the show, but what if I did show up? Like everyone knew I was there because I was the the weird old guy who who's standing at the back, and it's like, why? Who's this guy? Why is he here? Um, yeah. But you know, I was just right. I was just interested to see what was going on in Seattle, and and as I said, participate where I could in um, this you know creative community that that was so exciting to me. Well, let me ask you something. You just described yourself as this weird old guy. And if you were 20 years older, how, how well were you received by the community? Uh, surprisingly well, actually. And that's, and that's the thing. Like I, I'm extremely honored by, by how welcoming everyone was to me coming out to shows. And I mean, part of that is I think because I was approaching this a little bit because I have a background in media that I was showing up with a camera in hand and, mm -hmm. and as someone who had, uh, an increasingly larger social media presence of of people who were following me. So, so you know, getting your photo with me or me filming you at your show had the potential to raise your profile um, in the scene. So I think everyone was really excited by my presence uh, when I would show up at, at things. Um, uh, yeah. I don't know if that answers your question okay. exactly, but yeah, it does. Um, well, because let's, let's, let's be honest. You and I don't look like a typical hip hop fan. No, that's we true. Just, uh, and that's, we just don't. And, you know? um, yeah, it's funny though. I think, uh, I mean, I, I always really made a point and continue to like, I'm not, I, at some level, I'm I'm just there as a fan, and one of the things that I mm -hmm. I regret or I miss uh, is there was a time when I was a little bit more anonymous. Like I used to go to a show, and I could just stand in the audience and enjoy the music and enjoy the experience of being there, and then leave when I wanted to. And mm -hmm. um, you know that was ten years ago that I uh, that I started doing this. Um, Mm -hmm. Today, you know, I am someone that most of the artists in the scene know who I am because I'm the guy who has the record label and I'm the guy who, you know, had, I've made a movie, I've made, uh, I've, I've been covering this, these, these things on Instagram for 10 years. And, and I sometimes miss the anonymity of being able to just go to a show and be in the audience and watch the show and leave. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's, and that's something that has changed a lot over the years. Um, you know, there, there was a time though, the pand pandemic has also, I think, changed a lot for a lot of us. And, you know, there was a time in 2019 when, you know, I, I would show up at a show and the people on stage would be shouting me out in the audience, like, Hey, Gary's here, everybody cheer. Cause Gary's here. Or I had a rapper at one point who made up a verse about me and then got everyone in the audience to rap it along with him while he was doing the song like it's it's funny like this these experiences uh you don't really i didn't i didn't anticipate or sign up for any of this it's just sort of what <laughs> happened um 
Mm-hmm. And uh, but you know that's it's wonderful. It's it's a it's a life turns out in ways you don't expect, and sometimes you just roll with it and see where it takes you. Um, uh, yeah, you know, I, so I started this this Instagram account, and I covered it on things on Instagram for a long time, and um, you know, in in 2017, uh, because at the end of 2016, you know, there was a big federal election. And, uh-huh. uh, you know, Trump was elected, I think, much to everyone's surprise um, or mm-hmm. to a certain amount of surprise. And I think there was a real moment of reflection for a lot of people living in the United States between, you know, the the election night on in November and and the start of January when uh, Trump was inaugurated to really think about like what what does it mean to live in the United States? What does it mean to, to be here in, in the Northwest? And um, uh, around that time, I had been talking with a lot of artists about this idea of making a compilation album that we could make that would be a, a kind of celebration of everything that was uh, great about Seattle hip hop. You know, to me, there seemed to be such a scene of artists that I had been going to see for a number of years and people who had, you know, I guess represented this 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 not Macklemore uh, contingent of of people mm-hmm. in hip hop in the Northwest, um, and uh, at the same time we were also looking for how do we respond to how we're feeling about about this Trump election and and so that all of those reasons became a catalyst to start an album called um, which at one time was called it said Songs from Crane City but ultimately became called Solar Power. Um, which was a compilation vinyl that I put together with 14 um, uh, rappers and artists here in in the Northwest, which was intended to be a, you know, at first, a kind of a Seattle response to the Trump uh, uh, election win and mm-hmm. uh, became less less about that and less of a kind of angry response to something and more, uh, you know, one of the people I got a chance to work with on that project um, was a, a uh, painter uh, named Ari Glass. He is a very, very talented um, uh, a visual artist here in the Northwest. And Ari uh, has done a number of paintings, but um, he was also part of the group of artists who painted Black Lives Matter um, here mm-hmm. in Capitol Hill in Seattle, um, beside Cal Anderson Park. It was a big sort of 60 foot wide, Mm-hmm. 20 foot high black lives matter whatever the dimensions are i probably got those wrong um and ari was one of the artists who painted that black lives matter piece but i worked with him in 2012 and um he painted a, a painting that became the cover of this solar power compilation and okay. and when i talked to him he was the one who really said to me you know instead of instead of focusing on this negative this like we're we're upset that Trump was elected or we're, uh, we're upset about what this means for, um, you know, about America and about the future. He said, what if we make this album really a celebration of all the things that are great about the Northwest? And, and he was the one who titled the album solar power because he, he, at the time when we were talking, it was like February and it was, it's February is the hardest time in the Northwest because it's been dark for so long. And, and you feel like spring is coming, but it's not there yet. And you're you're waiting and you're waiting for spring. And and then that first moment of sun that you get, you get about a week in at the late February, and then and then it really kicks into high gear in April. And then you just it's just blue skies until October. And and he was saying, you know, there's that moment, that solar power moment when you get hit with that sun and you go, Oh, I remember why it's great to live here. And then it's just you're in this wonderful, like warming sense of, of uh, how great uh, the Northwest is. And solar power was, was really born out of that idea. And that was where the cover, um, the cover painting is a kind of a whole uh, kind of a, he, Ari works in a lot of gold leaf with his work. And mm-hmm. so the cover art is this beautiful, um, you know, solar kind of sun that is painted with all these little hoops and, and circles. Um and all with gold leaf and it's it's a the actual painting is a three feet square Uh, it is hanging in my living room um and and we um we took that that painting and scanned it and and used that as the cover art for this album 
Um, I'm, I'm on your website. Sure. There's a photo of somebody holding. I think that's the album. Is there a little in the upper corner? It's blue. Yes, There's that's a correct. Blue tri- that is correct. Oh, it's, yeah, it's a really cool, it's really cool artwork. Yeah, absolutely. It's and very cool. And we really wanted that album to be a celebration, as I said, of what was great uh, about music and and art in the Northwest. So Solar Power had 14 artists on it. Um, I made a conscious decision. I wanted seven women and seven um, men on the art on the album. Mm-hmm. Um, women are a big part of the Northwest hip hop scene. That's also something that I think is is different about music here, um, at least in the scene that uh, that I notice is is the the role of women um, and uh, the role of queer artists in the the mainstream hip hop scene is also uh, something that you note you take note of. Um, and and certainly wanting to celebrate uh, less mainstream voices, I think there's an opportunity to to put a shine on. You know, there's there's lots of people in music. We see this in music, whether it's in rock and roll or or anything else, um, hip hop as well. Is that there's a there's a mainstream sound, and there's a lot of people that are trying to emulate that mainstream sound. And, um, so I, I really wanted to focus on artists that were doing something unexpected and different and something you maybe wouldn't have heard before. And, and so the the solar power compilation was a real focus on that and, and on celebrating 14 voices, um, and people who you might not have otherwise, uh, heard of or, or know about their music. And, um, and that, that album, um, was a huge success. We, we debuted it at the Beacon Hill, um, summer block party. So in Beacon Hill, there was a block party, uh, done by the station coffee shop that year. Um, okay. that's a big coffee shop in Beacon Hill that is a kind of hub for the community. And, um, most of the artists that were on that compilation played at that block party and, um, we pressed up a thousand records and the record itself is a bright orange color. It's like the sun when you pull it out of the sleeve and um, it is intended to be an album that you can put on in the darkest days of winter and feel that glow of, of summertime sun and know that it's coming. Um, why, why albums? Hmm. I mean, because first off, that's not meant to be a critical statement. no, because I love, I love the idea of vinyl, but why, what was the inspiration for, for you to go bring this genre into vinyl? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, part of what I was trying to do and, you know, I think there's um, a little bit of the work that I do with Crane City Music is towards preservation. Like there's a sense of there's there's music happening in the city and there's a legacy of music happening in the city, and I and I personally see the way that that uh, people, you know, will covet a a jazz record from the '50s or um, someone I worked with early on as a distributor was a company called Light in the Attic and they're based here in the Northwest and Light in the Attic focuses on uh, compilations of scenes from um so you, you they'll have a record like uh nigerian folk rock from the 70s and this will be a okay. compilation of, of that music from that place um or a compilation of uh, psychedelic rock music from japan from you know the 80s or whatever the the right. stick five words together and and you've got a scene you know <laughs> beijing punk rock from the 2010s or you know, minimal techno from Germany, from the, these sorts of compilations. And I, and that was part of what I was thinking about when I wanted to put this record together was what is the sound of Seattle hip hop circa 2017. And at the time we were making the record, it was, it was all new music, but to think about this is something that someone 20 years from now is going to find this in a used bin and mm-hmm. we'll, we'll have a window into what, um, what is happening in what was happening in music at the time here in the Northwest. And, and you know, it's funny, like vinyl is, is, is has it, had this interesting lifespan. And I think because I don't want to put this like people have been putting music on vinyl records since the 1890s. Like this is a, a right. format that's been around for 
more than a hundred years. And, right. and in some ways there was a time in the, uh, turn of the millennium when, you know, Napster became big and CDs were sort of the dominant format for music. And it seemed like vinyl had really had its day and, and in vinyl never really died off. Like it, I think there was a lot of marketing efforts on the part of record labels to eliminate vinyl and, um, push people to new formats to CDs. I mean, I, I remember myself in, I don't know, 2003, 2004, I pretty much got rid of all my vinyl records and I rebought everything that I owned on vinyl on CD because vinyl was dead and we were all listening to CDs now. And then, you know, the, over time, I sort of found my, my way back to it. And I find it's, it's of all of the various music formats that exist, it's the one that continues to uh, thrive. I mean, in, even in 2022, I think more vinyl albums were sold than uh, CDs or cassettes or mm -hmm. any other physical format. Um, you, you can buy the new Harry Styles record on vinyl and the new Taylor Swift record on vinyl. Like there's, there's this, the new Beyonce record just came out on vinyl. Um, and so I think, you know, that's something that's been interesting is, is the way that I, that, that in many ways, the, the industry, it feels like more than anything, tried to end vinyl's reign over the last 10 or 15 years and, and failed. And vinyl continues to persist. Um, Do you think, I got, I got a couple of thoughts on this. Sure. Right, just let me, let me bounce these off. No, it's fine. Two, two thoughts. Number one is the act of listening to an album mm -hmm. requires you to you know, take it out of the, out of the sleeve, put it on the turntable, put the stylus on the, on the record. You know, you're at, you're at, you're an active participant and you're going to listen versus streaming something on Spotify or, you know, there's just some more, there's this more physical connection to the, to the process. To me, this is the way I view it. Yeah. Is that if I'm going to listen to a, a record, of course I'm old. So I say records and albums, they, you know, somebody a third of my age, they don't even really know what CDs are. And, but That's right. I, I think there's something tangible to an album versus a CD. Now, I, like you, got rid of all my albums and replaced them all with CDs, and I regret that choice. But when I go and buy vinyl now, it's not uncommon for me to have the album on display versus a CD that's just stacked up on the shelf. Okay. So that's one comment is to me, I think we actually more of an active listening and more of an, we're present during the, the process of consuming mm -hmm. the music versus it's earbuds in the background while we're doing the dishes. Number two, I don't disagree with you at all about the record industry trying to kill off vinyl, but do you think they've been able to position vinyl as the higher end alternative? Because albums are selling for what? 30 bucks now a pop. Yeah, I mean those are those are two great observations. I think there is it's funny like I so I worked in in media for a while, I worked in the tech industry for a while and you know, I think sometimes that like I look at streaming and someone said to me once, well, you know, why would you do vinyl records when you can do streaming? Like streaming so much more efficient. And I'm like, what, when have I ever listened to music and wished it was more efficient? Like it's, there's a, there's a sense of like, what, what is the experience that you are looking for? So here, I'm going to give you an example of this. Uh, there's been an ongoing debate that shows up every so often online. It's, and I guess various, because I worked in, in online video for a while. So I pay attention sometimes to what trends are in online video and there was a discussion online for a while that netflix was going to roll out a button not unlike with podcasts where you could watch shows at one and a half times speed or twice speed in the same way with a podcast you can push a little button and you can listen to this podcast at a much faster clip than normal and this was a question of like whether or not netflix was going to roll out this feature and at some level you have to ask yourself why like if if i'm trying to 
I understand the desire to binge watch TV is something that we all do, but I don't need to watch if I'm just trying to get through Game of Thrones and I can watch it all at double <laughs> speed is am I having the experience like I don't I think efficiency is a weird model that we apply to things like music and say that efficiency makes something better. Um and and that's something that I, I think about a lot with vinyl. Like when you said it yourself, like there's a ritual to I go to a store, I buy this thing, I hold it in my hand, it has weight. It there's I have to pull out the sleeve and, and I have to take this record and put it on this turntable. And and ideally my turntable has to be level and I have to put this little <laughs> this little arm on the turntable. Like there's a level of engagement with what I'm doing that is so different yeah. from the experience of pushing a play button and saying, now I can go do the dishes or something else. And I do find that is that I would work with a lot of people at Amazon um, who were coders who would spend their time writing computer code all day and, and loved wearing headphones and listening to music, but they, it wasn't to listen to the music. It was to tune out everything so they could just focus nice. on writing computer code. And the music right. for for someone like that is is a is the goal of the music is to be white noise, and and to me like I I have a, a kind of a criteria like if I put a record on and I'm and I'm doing house cleaning and I keep stopping what I'm doing because the music is so good like that's that's a sign of something that's worth paying attention to and if I clean my house and forget the records on then then it, it wasn't really an experience I was having. I don't know if that makes well, sense. Okay, but. it does. But but here's the other thing about the, the, about an album. Yeah, is it's a way for, in my opinion, it's a way for a, a fan of an artist to. If you go see Macklemore in concert, let's mm -hmm. just say, right? I'm going to go see Macklemore, and you buy a concert shirt. It's a way of it's social proof that you. Are in that club. I know that's true. You know, Macklemore. Yep. I'm aware of Macklemore. And an album, of course, the concert shirts are more than 30 bucks, but like I know I went to the last Grateful Dead shows in the Chicago, in Chicago at Soldier Field mm -hmm. when they played in 2015. And I think I spent more money on merch than I did on my three days of tickets. Okay. So I bought, you know, Grateful Dead merch at a concert and then had to lug it around the concert. It wasn't a real smart experience. <laughs> um, and I did that three days in a row. Um, but the point is I was happy to give them my money to wear that badge of, you know, I'm part of that club. Sure. So you buy a concert shirt, you're part of that club. But, but if you buy an album, I, I would wonder, okay, so you printed a thousand of these 2017 collaborations. Yep, this, the solar power compilation. I, I wonder how many of them never have been played. Yeah, I, that's entirely possible. Join us next time for another episode of the Exploring Washington State podcast.